everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Kim Bussey. I am the Key Relationship Manager here with Omnia. Today we are continuing our um, series, our October series, with How Soft Skills Affect Leadership. So just real quick, at the top of your screen there is an icon of a person with a hand raised. If you'll go ahead and raise your hand, let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, also at the top of this, um, you'll also see if you need agree or disagree, if you need me to speak a little louder or speak a little softer, if you ever want me to speed up or slow down. And of course, laughter and applause is always appreciated. This is going to be interactive. And as I said, this is number three of our four-week series. Um, the first week of October, we talked about the leadership advantage. Last week, we talked about how to succeed as a first-time manager. Both of those are now available on our YouTube channel. If you don't follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, make sure that you do. You'll get some great information as well as letting you know when our webinars are up. Um, this one is being recorded. It will be available by next week as well. And then our last um webinar next week in this october series is how to develop your team so if you notice there is a theme going on with our october webinar series we're talking about all skills so let's talk about one thing so today we're kind of talking about soft skills but what are hard skills and when you say soft skills what do you really mean by that so once again, I said it was going to be a little bit hard, um, interactive. So in that upper left-hand box, go ahead and name some of those hard skills that leaders need. What do you define as hard skills? And then in the bottom right-hand corner, go ahead and name some of those soft skills that you think leaders need. So, you know, back in 2007, Harvard Business Review conducted a study and it said that at that time that hard skills, those technical skills, were more important in a leader than the soft skills. And during the early 2000s, soft skills was almost like people would call them the mamby-pamby, warm and fuzzy skills. But what we're discovering is that the more that business changes, so has the need for soft skills. What some people would used to say is, oh, those are the warm and fuzzies, or now they're looking at it going, they've got some key um, traits, some key strengths, and now what are they? So some of the hard skills that we're seeing is typing, writing, math, reading, budgeting, accounting, absolutely. Some of those soft skills are adaptability and understanding, that self-regulation, self-awareness, employee relations, coaching. Sometimes it's the culture, listening, good interactions with others, absolutely. So when we look at hard skills and soft skills, think of it this way. Hard skills are those technical aspects that we need, and they are usually learned in school. So going back to accounting, budgeting, things of that nature. There's constant rules. So what we mean by constant rules is that and, you know, there might be some changes with the business, but you still, two plus two equals four, right? No matter how you you get to it, you know, there's common core math and schools now. Um, whether you count on your fingers, you just add two plus two vertically or horizontally. At the end of the day, the constant rule is two plus two is four. And that's the same with hard skills. Those rules don't change. Those technical skills don't change. And it manages people. I can tell you what is needed technically, and I can teach you technically to manage my team. However, soft skills always has changing rules. You have to be able to adapt. A lot of times it's learned through trial and error, right? So if you, how many of you, raise your hand, manage people, either now or have in the past? Go ahead and let me know if you've managed anyone. So I see some hands being raised, wonderful. So you know that a lot of times what motivates one person doesn't motivate someone else. And we learn, okay, how do I need to motivate Carrie versus how do I motivate Kim? And a lot of times we've learned it because we've hurt someone's feelings or we've completely demoralized it. 
or worst case scenario, someone just leaves and they don't tell us why they left, they're just gone. Soft skills leads people. For today's webinar, what we're going to do is to one, talk about balancing the balancing act of knowing when it's appropriate for soft skills versus hard skills. Where do you get those training for those hard and soft skills? Where do you find it? How do you understand the difference? And then where do we go from there? Before we begin, let's go ahead and make sure that we have soft skills defined. So for today's webinar, we're going to talk about it as those personality traits and abilities that can be practiced, such as leadership, empathy, communication, and sociability. Now, we all have our natural behavioral traits, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, about understanding who we are in a perfect world are in times of stress. How However, who we are and those natural behavioral traits can, under, by understanding that, we can adjust our challenges. We're all going to have our own challenges in leadership. We're all going to have our own challenges in communication. How do we adjust that? How do we understand that so that we can move forward with it? So General Colin Powell said this, great leaders are almost always great simplifiers who can cut through argument, debate, and doubt to offer a solution everybody can understand. And I want to emphasize everybody. How we simplify is very different. For some of us, some soft skills come more naturally than others. But we first have to really look at it and say, as a leader, what do I simplify? So let's talk about that for a moment. What does that quote mean to you? Once again, Great leaders are almost always great simplifiers who can cut through argument, debate, and doubt to offer a solution everybody can understand. Go ahead and type in, when you hear that, what does that make you think about? For me, when I hear that quote, I'm like, yeah, as a leader, which is the biggest difference between a manager. A manager sees the problem and they manage the problem. However, a leader, sees the solution and teaches others. They cut through all of the difficulties to say at the end of the day, here is the solution and here's how we're going to get there. And as a leader, their job is to motivate and to understand each person that they lead, their strengths, their challenges, and just who they are so that they can continue to help that person move forward. So that's what that quote means for me. I know that we have a couple of people typing. Go ahead. Um, keep this in mind. I like to say our webinars are kind of like Vegas. What's said here stays here. We want to share these ideas. So if you hear something that's great, go ahead and type it into in there. If you hear something that you don't agree with, go ahead and share that too. So when we talk about this, and, and as I said, I see some people typing. So we're going to give them a few more moments. Colin Powell. Without a doubt, it's a great leader, right? He he's listens, he understands. So continue to type away. I'm going to give you just one moment. Okay. Okay. So great quote. Love it when pr leaders practice this very thing. Absolutely. A leader is able to adapt to all people and styles and takes the responsibility of ensuring everyone understands the message rather than just putting the message out there in their own way and expecting everyone to understand. Julie, I think that's a great key. Um, I love both of these things. And this is the heart of what soft skills are. A manager can put out the message in my way and I can expect you to understand it. However, Instead of my way is the highway, how much better would it be if I change my soft skills, if I change, like, here's my message and deal with it and understand it and you, what do you mean you have questions? I explained it perfectly because it sounds great in my mind to say, okay, let's open this dialogue. And with soft skills, that's what, that's the heart of the soft skills. That's what we're going to talk about today because everyone, I, I can sit there and say, okay, push you know, F1, F6, type it, fill in this field. As you fill it in, it's going to jump to the next field or it's going to autofill. 
but leaders don't want to manage the process. They want to guide their employees to be better, to understand the vision of the team, to for succession planning. And it's key for us to understand that. As leaders yourself, whether you're a leader with the title or a leader because you're someone that your peers go to, or you're looking to become a manager or a leader, you have to understand that. And before you can understand, you know, what soft skills do I need to work on, assess yourself. Let's talk about it. So let's see that, you know, we have one more comment. A leader is a person who's led by example and earned respect from their followers. That's key. You know, we can demand respect and we may get it because of a title, but when you've earned it, it's because you've been there, you've done it, you've experienced it. You can say, here's what I've learned. You know, don't do this or, you know, learn from my past experiences. It's this way is a lot easier. So by that and knowing that your leader is for you and not just in it for themselves allows you to begin to respect them. So as I said, we all have our own way of doing things and we all have our natural behavioral traits. But soft skills can come down to two very, or to four natural traits. So it comes down to leadership, communication, pace, and structure. So the soft skills that are needed under leadership are the coaching, and mentoring. You have to be able to understand who your people are. Conflict resolution. How do you handle conflict? Are you that person who runs towards it or avoids it? Do you like taking some calculated risk? That's key to understand too because when we think about calculated risk, what does that mean? Does it mean that I'm willing to dive off the, you know, a 30-foot diving board or do I want to stay in my comfort zone? When we talk about the soft skill of communication, it breaks down to interviewing. How do I interview? How do I make presentations? And even more important, what are my listening skills? How do I listen to people? When you think about that natural behavioral trait of pace, you know, it falls into line of those soft skills of goal setting, your personal time management, and introducing your change. So raise your hand if you've been um, in a company where someone has said, I've got, you know, we're going to have change. I think it needs to happen immediately. And regardless of what is happening within the company, whether it's a busy season, people are on vacation, the change just happens, right? I've been there. It's difficult because sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't handle this are you know why are we changing in the busiest time of our season could this have not waited and by not knowing when's the best time to introduce change that soft skill you can cause some organizational conflict which we've talked about in our conflict um webinar you could cause your team to have extreme stress because okay i can't deal with this you can cause a decrease in productivity Understanding that is critical. And then that last natural behavioral trait is structure. We all have our different ways of looking at structure. You know, some of us are very big picture and, you know, here's my idea and let's go. I have a dream and that falls into their strategic planning of let me just keep an eye on the big picture. Other people are very detail oriented. They want to know, you know, step by step, I'm going to give you all of the information. We're going to focus on um, delegation and making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. So when you think about how you approach structure, it's also going to affect your soft skills of strategic planning, of delegation, as well as innovation. And you're probably thinking innovation Absolutely. Are you thinking about the next big thing? Are you looking at it going, okay, how can I refine a process? So for many of you, you will notice this next leader, Steve Jobs, right? He is the founder of Apple. He was a um, amazing leader, but let's talk about him for a moment. Steve Jobs falls into one or two categories. He's the either you love him or you hate him leader. 
So let's talk about first in the lower left hand box, go ahead and type in some of Steve Jobs' good leadership traits. Some of those leadership traits that you're like, wow, if I could emulate this, I would be an amazing leader. Maybe you're thinking, I hate Steve Jobs. So you're more on the uh, lower right hand side where you're going to name some of Steve Jobs' bad leadership traits. Go ahead and type those in as well. So for some of his good leadership traits, he was innovator, very innovator. He was a motivator. He was a risk taker, absolutely. He was that person who said, you know what? Um, I don't like the way this is looking. We're going to scrap everything and start all over again. He was inspired. He was hands-on when it came to those, you know, innovation pieces of things. So let's kind of skip over. So what were some of his bad leadership traits? Go ahead, and, and yes, Kathleen, he was a great presenter. You know, you can see YouTube videos of him presenting and why he presents the way he presented. So he had some good qualities. But what were some of his bad quality leadership traits? Yeah, he lacked empathy. You know, some people called him a bully. Um, if you know anything about Apple's history and Steve Jobs, he was fired from Apple. I read a recent article where his early employees hated him and they said they would never work for him again. Even after he came back from, from being fired and, and took Apple over again, he was a bully. He had no problems telling people that they were idiots. If you ask his team, he had his top 100 employees and it didn't, they could have been a receptionist to sea level. It wasn't based on position. It was based on that year what potential he saw in them, what they were contributing to the company. And then at the end of the day, a lot of people said if you weren't in that top 100, you were kind of dead to him. That he didn't care about you. He didn't want to talk with you. He wanted to focus on those A people. He was arrogant. He was. It was my way or the highway. When you know, sometimes he wasn't fiscally responsible because he scrapped, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a project because he didn't like the way it looked. And the reason why we talk about him, he's probably one of the most polarizing leaders, and you know, in the 2000s. And the reason for that is that. He has some good traits. He had some bad traits. But at the end of the day, he owned his leadership style. He knew who he was. He owned it. And he, he didn't apologize for it. He said, this is who I am. In later interviews when he came back to Apple and people asked him, what did you learn from being you know, fired from the company? He said, I learned, one, that I needed to operate in my strengths. I was trying to do too much. I was trying to operate in my weaknesses. And you know what? I'm not really that financial guy. I don't want to count, you know, the widgets. I don't want to dot every I and cross every T. I want to be the person who's innovating. I care about people. And yes, at times he could bully people and make them, you know, and belittle them. But most of his team said, you know what? I can be, I can do well with this. I, he's pushing me to move forward. Read an article where in his later days, one of his C-suite um, leaders came to visit him at home and he was on the liver transplant and list. And the leader was tested and said, you know, I'm a match. Let me give you part of my liver. And he said, no, because it's going to put your health at risk. I would rather wait. So in a time that people were um, saying, he's arrogant, it's all about you, he put people in front of himself. So whether you love him or hate him, he knew who he was, he understood his challenges, in his later years he emphasized for those things that he was aware of, such as presenting, such as innovating, and then he put others in place. So my question to you is, do you know your leadership style? Do you know your strengths? Do you know your challenges? Do you know, am I that assertive person? No, I'm not. And if not, 
then at the end of our um, webinar, we're going to give you an opportunity to take an as our Omni assessment so that you can learn your leadership style. Because here's the thing, everyone leads a little bit differently. You have to know your leadership style so that you know how to adjust, what to talk about. Am I that person that runs towards conflict or am I that person that runs away from it? Am I people focused or am I at that point where it's all facts and figures? Maybe you're the assertive leader. So some of the strengths of that assertive leader is that assertiveness, that ability to take charge. They're comfortable with those calculated risks. They're self-motivating. Some of their challenges, though, is that they're so assertive they can appear aggressive. It's my way or the highway. This is the way we're going to do it. And if not, then oh well, move on. Or maybe you associate a little bit more with that collaborative leader. So some of those strengths are collaboration, bringing that team consensus, expanding comfort zones in a slow manner. Like I'm not going to say, okay, we're going to be able to jump from $100,000 in revenue to a million dollars in revenue in six months. Might be possible, but I might say we're going to go from 100000 and we want to increase by 100000 every month, and this is how we're going to do it. But some of the challenges with that collaborative leader is conflict resolution. They're more that let's see if it works itself out versus addressing it. Also, quickly addressing personnel issues. Once again, you know, I know that there's a problem, but how do I address it? Maybe it'll work itself out. I really hope it does. I don't know. So ask yourself these questions. Maybe you're wondering, oh, I've got a little bit of both of those. And you may, but in a perfect world or in times of stress, what do you revert back to? So ask yourself, once I have a goal, I'm going to reach it no matter what. Is it always, almost always, sometimes, rarely, or never? Go ahead and check which one you think it is. Now, I find it difficult to say no. Yes, no. Or it depends on the person asking. People with strong opinions make me nervous. Always, almost always, sometimes, rarely, never. And then last but not least is I love leading difficult people. Woohoo! Yes, I love the challenge. I'm going to show them who's boss because I can lead them. Or no, it wears me out. Why can't we all just get along and be grown ups? So let's look at this. So overwhelmingly, uh, about 85% of you said, almost always, I've got a goal. I'm going to reach it no matter what, no matter what it takes. But think about that. That's a great strength. But at the same time, if you're so like, I'm going to reach it, are you leading, um, as a client of mine says, dead bodies in your wake? You know, are you stepping over people? Are you saying, okay, I have a goal and I'm a leader and we're going to reach it? but I don't care what it does to my team. I find it difficult to say no. Overwhelmingly, 71% depends on the person asking. Now, is that because it's the person asking your, your supervisor, your leader, and now let's talk about that, or is it because of friendship, of understanding and knowing the person? Is it because of empathy because you know what they're going through we need to really look, take a step back and know that you know people are important but sometimes we have to weigh the good of the goal over you know the good of the people people with strong opinions make me nervous so 67 66 percent of you said sometimes and is it that they have a strong opinion or is it because of how they express that opinion? You know, if you're on any type of social media right now, there is, we are in a very um, tumultuous time right now with the political race and we're not going into politics, but think about that. As we're talking about social media, everyone has an opinion for Hillary or for Trump. And so you've got to look at it, and, and they're not afraid to express it. And I think for me, as many times as I've been able to vote in an election year, I think this is the first time, or maybe it's because social media is so popular now, 
that I see the people so polarized and and it's just a nasty campaign and people are unafraid to say I hate this candidate and I hate this candidate or they're both dumb and I don't want any of them so it's not necessarily the strong opinion that makes us nervous but sometimes it's how it's stated how it's given and communicated if you're that person who feels very passionate about things, really look at how you're communicating that information because it may need to be taken down a little bit. Maybe we need to take a look at how we're communicating it so that we can still get the point across, but in a matter of building consensus versus saying, this is my opinion, take it or leave it. And then last but not least is 78% of you said, no, leading difficult people wear me out and a lot of times as we're talking about that as we're looking at those difficult people we have a tendency to write them off like Ugh, I just can't deal with Kim anymore I'm just done with her I'm writing her off but at the end of the day sometimes those most difficult people that we're leading turn out to be the best employees are they difficult because they're truly difficult or are they difficult because we as leaders aren't exercising the right skills to get them to where they need to be so let's talk about this if you respond more to that assertive leader you want to allow your team to speak first so a lot of times as that assertive leader we're going to speak up and say so what do you think about this quote here's what I think you want to make sure you're setting, giving them that time to speak first. Because if you have someone on your team who's much more collaborative, who's um, less inclined to speak up, then they're going to wait for the perfect time. Or the opinion could be, oh, wait, we're just going to let, this is what the boss said, so we'll just go with them. Practice the soft skill of silence. Count to 10 in your head. Count to 20 in your head to give them the opportunity to speak up. Set realistic time frame. So, you know, being that goal-driven person, you want to reach your goals as quickly as possible. But are they realistic? Are you creating an environment where your team is being dragged behind you versus walking beside you? And that is going to be key. Also, just to let y'all know that the PowerPoint presentation is going to be available for download after the um, presentation as well so if you haven't received it yet you can download it um, as well so you also want to create an environment where questions are welcome so once again it avoids that my way is the highway type of thing where I have declared it this is the way it's going to be and everyone kind of goes okay it's not open or sometimes we create that environment by what we say and how we say it Hey, Kim, I have this idea. What do you think about that? No, that, that's not a good idea. No, eh. Are we just giving that look like, really? And it could be unintentional, but we have to practice the soft skills of listening, of that communicating. And a lot of times the assertive leader just wants to step in. Let's solve this problem. Let's move on. But we have to allow our team to work through conflict before stepping in. All of that plays into a part of how to develop your team. You, they've got to know that you're for them, that you're going to be that person that steps in front of them and, and stops the gap and not throw them underneath the bus. But as you allow them to work through the conflict, you're giving them the skills to be able to become leaders. If you're more of that collaborative leader, you want to set the direction of the team and keep the goal as the top priority. So a lot of times when it's collaborative, you may be chasing four or five different ideas, but ultimately, how does it lead us to the team? You want to gather the facts, but make the final decision. Think of it like a coach, uh, a football coach. We're in football season, right? So a head coach doesn't coach every single position. No, he has an offensive coach. He has a defensive line coach. He has a special teams coach. He has a quarterback coach. He's got all these different coaches who are operating in their specialty. 
and he gathers the facts from them. They watch the game tape. He's listening to these adjustments. But at the end of the day, the head coach calls the final play. He's the one that says, this is what we need to do. So as a collaborative leader, that might be a challenge of yours to say, okay, well, I listen, but I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Gather the facts and then say, this is the direction that we're going to. It's going to help you keep that goal as your top priority. It's going to help set the direction of the team. And it's also going to allow you to be that leader. And then practice resolution, not avoidance. So a lot of times that collaborative leader does want to kind of run away from conflict, whether it's because, you know, maybe you're more of that people person and you care more about, you know, the feelings are you've been promoted. So a lot of times this is a very tough soft skill to practice when you are promoted and now you are managing and leading your peers. Because we used to be friends. We used to vent to each other about the leadership. Oh, wait, now I am the leader. So it's going to have to be redefining those soft skills of here's our boundaries. Here's what we can share. Here's what I can't share. Oh, yeah. And I'm still going to hold you accountable. Because it goes right back down to communication as well. So think about it. What are some of the things that communication does? Well, it analyzes the facts and the situation. It corrects past behaviors. If it's done wrong, it can be a great demotivator, right? I, uh, both verbally and non-verbally. You come to my office and I'm constantly checking my phone, I'm demotivating you. If I'm on a video, a Skype call or video conferencing with remote employees and I'm not paying attention, it's a demotivator. But when done correctly, it's going to motivate your team. It's going to get them excited to follow you. It's going to, you're going to earn their respect. Great communicators listen. And then they take what they've learned to guide their employees to the right decision. Instead of being a dictator, they're a facilitator. They're a guide. They're going to ask questions. What's going on? Why do we need to do this? And it is the number one skill needed to be a successful leader. Hands down. Because if we cannot communicate with our teams, then we're lost. It's like being the one person who's saying, pull, pull, and no one can hear us. Without communication, we can't convey the vision. We can't offer correction. We can't talk to them about successes. We can't talk to them about debrief about challenges and how we can overcome it. If we cannot connect with our team through communication and that soft skill, it's all lost. So let's think about it. So we have two forms of communicators. We have the relational communicator and we have the analytical communicator. So the relational communicator is that person who is very much in people person, you know, intuitive. The analytical communicator is more that factual person. They're that problem solver. So the relational is going to motivate people like, woohoo, we're doing a great job. High five. Let's keep it up. The analytical communicator is only going to come to you when there's a problem. Hey, Kim, there's a typo on paragraph four, word three on page two of this report. Because they lead a little bit, they think a little bit more along the lines. You're getting a paycheck. So no news is good news. So depending on which side you fall on, some of the ways that you can be a better communicator if you're a relational communicator is practice the soft skill of giving specific feedback. I overheard your call on the phone with this client and this is why you, you address their issue, you offered a solution, you followed back up with them, you resolved the issue. When you're talking to your team, sometimes your team is going to be like, yeah, everything's great, but sometimes you need facts to support your decision. For me, I'm a very relational communicator, but I've already, you know, I mentioned some facts. So in 2007, a Harvard Business Review conduct that conducted that said that the technical skills were more important than the soft skills. Now I've established 
in 2007, it was very much hard skills. However, in recent studies, as early as 2011, Harvard Business Review conducted another survey where they said that more and more they find that this once people reach the C-suite, technical and functional expertise matters less than leadership skills and a strong grasp of business fundamentals. So based on those two different studies conducted by HBR, within four years of each other, we have seen a decided trend that is moving from technical skills to understanding the people skills, the leadership skills, and understanding those business fundamentals such as how to motivate, how to cast vision, how to present information, how to ensure that people, which is your number one expense, are in the right seat, in the right position, who are doing their jobs effectively, and how are we retaining this top performing performers. It's facts. So I could say, hey y'all, you know, it used to be that it, you know, it was all technical skills, but now it is that we truly have to focus on the soft skills. We have to understand our people. For some of you, you're like, yeah, I feel it. I've been in the business world for 20 plus years, and I agree, there's been a shift in business. For other people, they're going to say, okay, you're telling me there's a shift in business, but how do you know that? Because there's been studies that have uphold that information. And if you're in that relational communicator, a lot of times we want everyone to like us and like the outcome. But we have to understand not everyone will like the outcome. They may buy into the vision, but if I have to say, you know what, Kathleen and Sabrina, you are great employees and both of you applied for this position and we're going to go ahead and promote Kathleen for it. So Kathleen's happy about it, right? Sabrina, not so much. She's like, really? You know, can you tell me why? But can you communicate that? And are you willing to take the stand to say, I'm okay if everyone doesn't like the outcome. I want to make sure that we're still on the page, but I'm going to keep the goal and the greater good in sight. And the greater good may be what's best for the team. For your analytical communicators, you want to practice having those frequent one-to-one -one conversations. More analytical communicators tend to be one, those people who do focus a lot on the facts and the figures. So make a point of having some conversation. Maybe you put, put it on your calendar. I'm going to talk to three people today as a task, 9, 2, and 3 o'clock. Or before I come in, I'm going to walk around the office and say hello to people. You want to make sure that you're recognizing effort as well as results. And then consider the feelings and the facts. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, what I mean by that, a lot of times people are like, oh, she's getting warm and fuzzy. No, people are your number one expense in a business. So you've got to consider the feelings. For example, if I said, you know, Sarah, this presentation isn't working, I could crush her, right? Because I'm not, I'm just stating a fact. It's not working. But if I said, Sarah, the presentation looked great. The timings were a little bit off. Can we work on this? Okay, so I've considered her. I've given her some positive reinforcement. And we've still addressed the issue, which, by the way, Sarah does all of our presentations is, and is phenomenal. So I have no complaints at all. But um, just knowing that you can point things out without being harsh and rude. And sometimes the analytical communicators can come across as very direct and blunt. So we do need to make a point of making sure that we are a little bit more aware of how it's coming across, especially in times of stress. So we've talked about that communication. We talked about leadership. So let's talk about some of those soft skills in pace, right? So there's different ways that people move. So preferred pace influences that time management, introducing change, leading your team. So a lot of times we tend to coach at our own pace and get frustrated when people don't share those same priorities. So ask yourself, am I that person who just likes to do 20 things at one time and I multitasking is no problem for me? But yeah, every once in a while I, you know, don't remember something or whew. My stress level gets a little bit high because I, I remember I've, I've double booked myself, but 
overall, I'm good with it. I like those interruptions. Are you that person who wants to start one thing and just see it through to completion? Ask yourself, have you heard yourself say or can someone in the office say that you have ever said, you know what, I've got my own way of doing things. Don't mess with it. Like, I, I, I'm good. Don't mess with my desk. I've got process. So when you think about it, if you're that multitasker who thrives on that experience, we tend to coach that way. So before coming to Omnia, I worked as a branch manager for a bank. And for those of you that don't know, there is a short amount of time that you have before coming in um, between the employees coming in the um, branch to open and it being open for customers. And I freely admit I'm that person who's like, let's just get her done, fast paced. So we would come in, I would hit control, alt, delete, see my computer start to boot up, and then I'm out of there because a lot of things had to be done under dual control. Banks frown with one person going into the vault by themselves. I had a teller who was amazing at her job. She was a true leader, even though she didn't have the title and didn't want it. She had been, um, a teller and in banking for 40 plus years. Ask her where she wanted to go. She say retire because she was about five years out. She liked to come in, hit control, alt, delete, and watch the computer boot up. All of that language she had to watch. The scrolling code that even now is making my eyes roll in the back of my head because it's just too much to think about. She had to watch it. And her process was to watch it. When it came up, she would sign into her teller system that she had to have to make transactions, sign into her email, put her purse into her cubby, grab her keys, and be ready to go to the vault. That was her process. Every time I pulled her from that process, she made more errors. She was discombobulated throughout the day. She didn't know what was going on. Uh, and I just, she was just off. And for me, I didn't understand. I'm like, really? What is wrong with you today? And then I finally realized through trial and error, I'm the problem. I'm pulling her. 14 different ways because I want her to move at my pace. But I was doing my employee a disservice by doing that. I needed to give her the opportunity to follow her process, which made no sense to me as well, but it wasn't against company policy. And when I did, she didn't have any outages. She was on point. Her customer service was better. So when you think about what's the pace that you work at, Think about how you're introducing change. For someone who's very process oriented, introduce it as slowly as possible. Realize that with that change coming, that there's going to be a decrease in productivity while they're understanding the steps and re-internalizing it. If you're that person who likes that process, then you need to let your team know, hey, I need some time. I'm working through this you know, project. Can we limit the, inter the interruptions? So as you're thinking about your pace and how you work, ask yourself this. Are my goals realistic? Is my time frame the way it should be? What's the purpose of the change? Am I just making change to change? You know, last week we talked about the, you know, first time managers. And one of the things that we talked about was during the first 90 days, don't make change. Because a lot of times we come in, especially in a new role, and say, oh, we're going to make this change because I can. I always hated this. Ask yourself, is this the right time to introduce a change? So maybe the change is something that's necessary. However, when you're thinking about it, it's, it's, we're in the peak side time. You know, do we really want to do a complete system change in our busiest time? If you can avoid it, then do that. And then do my expectations cause myself or my team stress? What I mean by that is if you're that assertive leader who's also very fast paced, you may have an unrealistic time frame. You set very high goals for yourself and for others. And then by the end of the day, you're like, okay, what do I need to do? How do I need to do it? 
and and they're like, we 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 can't follow you. We can't move this fast. And you're like, well, why not? Because we don't understand it. And that ties directly into structure as well. So when you think about it, if you're fast paced and want to get things done as quickly as possible, but you're not giving enough information, stop. Stop it. Stop. Because you want to make sure that you're giving enough information. Is everyone together? Are we on the same path? We're giving enough information. We're allowing our team to ask questions. You're delegating appropriately. So let's talk about this. Delegation. If you're that person who's like, you know what, I've got my eye on the prize. I don't really care how I get there. In fact, I do better when someone says, here's your goal and lets me go for it. You need to practice delegation, appropriate delegation. And what we mean by appropriate delegation is that you're taking a step back and you're saying, okay, here's what I need done. Let me set the guidelines out for you. Let me allow you to ask some questions and then move forward because a lot of times what we do is like hey Kim I need a report by Friday at 2 o'clock on, on our past customer usage and I'm walking away pouting myself on the back because I told you a time but I may be sitting here going okay well what do you want of it what kind of information do you want you know where do you you said Friday at 2 o'clock is this something that's going to be ongoing do you, how do you want it formatted you know, what kind, do you want a chart? I need more information. If we're not giving those guidelines and giving that information, then I'm going to come back to you and say, hey, I know you said you wanted this report by Friday at 2 o'clock. I have a few questions. And then it's going to feel like I'm rolling the list down the hall with my questions. And then you're going to get frustrated. But maybe you're on the other end of that spectrum. And you are much more reliant on structure. You want the I's dotted and the T's crossed. You want to make sure everything is perfect. Well, I know I can be perfect, but I don't know about you. You made a mistake about three years ago. And so I'm not sure. Or I'm going to tell you how to do it. And I'm going to tell you how to do it all the way down to the very little nitty gritty. Well, what I'm doing then is as a manager, I may be perceived as a micromanager. So ask yourself, am I a micromanager? Do I want them to do it my way, exactly my way, because it's the right way, and if they find a different way of doing it, even though it's getting us to the same goal, even though it's not violating policy, I don't like the way they're doing it because it's not the way I want it done. If that's you, in the words of Elsa, from frozen let it go because you can't do everything yourself and when you try to take care of everything yourself it's going to lead to overextension but you're teaching your team you know what I don't really care about what you say um, I can do it I can do it right so you just do what I tell you to do and you start distributing it in little pieces and as you distribute it in little pieces then you turn from a leader into a manager so if that's you, what you do need to do is once again set those guidelines and then trust but verify. So you want to trust them to do what you're telling them to do, but you can't just give them carte blanche. You want to go back and verify, make sure it's right, and then understand that mistakes can happen. This is key. As a leader, you know, if we think back to our leaders, we want to know that we made mistakes. And just know for yourself, too, is as you're learning these skills, as you're saying, okay, this is how I communicate. Ooh, I am not a very good motivator. Ooh, I am really fast-paced and stress people out with my impatience. That's okay. Don't stay in the mistake. What are you going to learn? How are you going to grow from it to avoid that mistake in the future? And then how are you going to help your team avoid those mistakes in the future? Our very first job as leaders is to replicate ourselves. So we want to teach others. We want to engage and connect with them. And as we engage and connect with them, they're going to learn. They're going to want to move forward. They're going to want to understand who we are and what we do so that they can move forward. So at the end of the day, they're ready to be a leader as well. So 
if a through z equals 1 through 26, then k plus n plus o plus w plus l plus e plus d plus g plus e equals 96%, right? So you see the numbers correlating. And hard work equals 98%. Both are critical, right? As a leader, we have to have the knowledge. We have to have the technical skills needed. We have to have the hard work. You know, no one wants to promote someone who's lazy. No one wants to work for a leader who doesn't know what they're doing. But while both are important, they just fall short of 100%. But A plus T plus T plus I plus T plus U plus D plus E attitude equals 100%. Your attitude and the soft skills, remember, it's those personality traits that you're putting into place that allows you to practice your leadership, your empathy, your communication, and sociability. That's what leads to amazing leadership. So yes, you have to have skills. You have to have technical knowledge. But you also have to have the attitude of willing, being willing to learn these soft skills to practice these soft skills on a daily basis to be able to truly, truly grow as a leader. So you may be thinking, okay, you've told me some of these soft skills, but really what does that mean? How do I grow from it? Well, first, you can learn some of those practices next week and how to develop your team. Same time, Thursday at 12.30, join us. Go ahead and sign up for that. Also, if you haven't taken your leadership assessment yet, maybe this is your first time joining us, we are giving you a free promo, uh, a free assessment. Um, so you can click on that where it says try your assessment. The promo code is 1020 um, 2016. Take your assessment. This is what Omnia does. We are a behavioral assessment company that helps with the selection and development. So see, am I that assertive leader? Am I relational? Am I fast paced? Am I big picture? It'll talk to you about your strengths, your challenges, as well as some action plans. Go ahead and in the box, you can type in any questions that you have. If you didn't get a chance, you can download our presentation as well, as well as the soft skills assessment handout. So that is something for you, just really for you to take a look at, to say, here's my strengths, here's my challenges. On a scale of one to five, how would I rate myself? Once you've rated yourself, then that gives you the opportunity to look for some additional tools, use your assessment, look at some training and professional development. Maybe it's watching some additional um, webinars that we've offered in the past or we'll be offering in 2017 to really focus on that. So once again, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the box for us. And you can also register for your for next week's webinar as well. So one of the things that just to share with you as we're waiting for questions to be typed in is that one of the questions I always had is, how important is it to adjust our styles to really become that soft skills, um, understand those soft skills? And I've been a leader and a manager for 20 plus years. And looking back when I started when I was 19, uh, the things I know now, I wish I had known there. I've learned that people don't communicate the way I communicate that people are not motivated by the same things I'm motivated by. And so I've had to learn to adjust and to, first of all, communicate, to talk with them. What can I help you with? What can I do better? And then once again, understand from them what they're, they're looking for and to help them grow as they're developing their own soft skills. So if you're managing someone really impatient, how to bring it down, so that they can understand the importance of not everyone works at their same pace. So I'm not seeing any questions. If you do have anything that you like, you can go ahead and type it, um, email me directly or give me a call. Once again, if you have not taken your leadership assessment yet, you can go ahead and click on our link and use that promo code as well as register for our upcoming webinar, How to Develop Your Team. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Thank you all for joining us, and I look forward to talking with you 
um, on November, November the, let me verify that. I want to say November the 3rd. We are moving our, it is November the 3rd for our next Lunch and Learn. Tanya Devane will be doing next week's How to Develop Your Team. So I hope you have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.